Hey now, brawlers, it's time for another Board Game Brawl review with Nick Minahan, sponsored by BoardGameBliss.com. Hey now, today we're going to take a look at The Grizzled, most recently released from Cool Mini or Not. The original French version of this game, I'm probably going to butcher this, was called Les Poilus, something to that effect, which literally means either the grizzled or the hairy ones. It was a term for French infantrymen. And the theme of this game is, I'd say it's kind of dark in a way, although you don't really get that feeling too much as you're playing it. It has to do with soldiers in World War I, specifically a group of friends who are uh, find themselves inexplicably dressed drafted into the army and have to just survive. All they're trying to do is get home, and you are those infantrymen. You are trying to work together. This is a purely cooperative game of you trying to play cards from your hand in order to survive the different threats during World War I. I will also say, as a side note, it has nothing to do with the gameplay, but I thought it was both interesting and a very uh, somber and sort of tragic note to the game, is that the artwork for this game is from a gentleman named Tignus, who was one of the people killed during the Charlie Hebdo attack. So, and, and and I will say right now, the artwork in this game is phenomenal. I'll also say that in my final thoughts as well. But let me go ahead and give you a brief look at how the game is played. Then we're going to come back. I'll let you know what I think. All right, let me give you a brief overview of The Grizzled. This is a purely cooperative game for two to five players. I do not recommend playing with two. Three to five is fine. The goal of this game, uh, thematically, is you are a group of French World War I soldiers who have been conscripted by the military, and you are just trying to survive the war. So mechanically speaking, what you need to do, you're going to have a deck of 25 trial cards. You're going to put those on top of this peace card, this, uh, this dove symbol. You want to uncover that card, which means go through every single trial card that is on top of that card. Uh, those are going to be going into your hands, and if you can uncover that card and then every player gets rid of all the cards from their hands, therefore they've gotten rid of every single trial card, then you can win the game. But that is easier said than done, obviously. The losing condition of the game, well, there's actually two different lose conditions. One, this is the morale deck. This is constantly going to be running out every round and flooding into, potentially, flooding into the trial deck and making it harder for you to win. And if it gets too bad, and this is the monument underneath it is uncovered, that is to say it's a monument, uh, a grave, to essentially, to each of the, uh, the heroes from this town that have died, you lose the game. So you don't want that to happen. You need to go through the trial deck before the morale deck runs out. Um, these are all the same type of cards, the trial cards, but it's just that you put the 25 here and then the remainder go on top of the monument card. The other way that you can possibly lose the game, there are these cards called hard knocks, which I'll explain in more detail in a moment. Um, if you take a total of four hard knocks, essentially four of these red symbols here, then at the uh, during the end of the round, and during one of the end phases, if any player has four of those in front of them, you all lose the game because you have essentially died. That represents wounds. Now to go over the rest of the setup, each player is going to have a character card that they start off with. You can do this randomly or by choice. It doesn't really matter. Um, they're all mostly the same. They have some really nice artwork, which I, I really appreciate in this game. Um, and they have a front and a back side. On the front side, which you start off with, is their uh, the Lucky Charm side. This is a special ability that you have access to that you can only use once. And once you've used it, uh, you have to do something special in order to recover it. I'll get to that. Uh, but this essentially allows you to get rid of a threat from the now empty no man's land, the empty space that will soon fill up with threat cards um, as you go through the course of the game. So flipping over and using your power lets you get rid of one of those cards that has that particular threat symbol on it. And again, we'll get to what those different threats are. You also have support tokens. Now, these support tokens are going to have, again, they'll have some really nice artwork, very small, but each player is going to get a set of a left token and a right token, and then you're going to get a random token from what's left, which may be these double arrow tokens, which means two to the left or two to the right. I'll explain all of that. You also have a first player marker, which you'll randomly decide who gets it at the start, and that's going to pass at the end of every round, which is also called missions. And you have speech tokens. They'll the, these little tokens that I had between the two decks of cards. Um, these, you have a certain number of them depending on the number of players. So in a five-player game, you only have three of them. They're very, very powerful, but you may or may not be able to get them depending on how successful your missions are. 
Now, before I start going through the overview, I will make a mention that there is limited communication in this game. So starting with the support tokens, people can know at the start of the game which support tokens you have, but during the course of the secret, you can't tell people what they are, nor as you uh, load up your hands with trial cards, can you tell the other players exactly what you have in your hands. And there's some question I have as to just how much communication is permissible and what's not, but uh, if all else fails, you should definitely play by at least Shadows Over Camelot or the game rules, which is to say you can't say exactly what's in your hands, but you can give a good indication of what people should be doing, things like that, but you may not even be able to do that much. Eh, it kind of depends on your group. All right, so the best way for me to kind of illustrate how you're going to go through this deck and potentially win the game is just to walk you through the game. So the first thing you do is the preparation phase. Whoever has the leader marker, the first player marker, is going to determine the intensity of the mission. And what that means is that you're going to go to the trials deck and you're going to take cards and pass them out to each of the players. The number of cards you take is the intensity. Now, on the first mission of the game, it has to be a minimum of three cards to each player. On future missions, it's only a minimum of one card. However, the less cards that you deal out, the slower you're going to be going through the trial deck, and the faster morale cards are potentially going to go into the deck. Um, maybe, maybe not. That's a little bit dependent, but you it's kind of a race against time because... the time is ticking down because a minimum amount of cards are always going to be going into the trial deck so you want to set the intensity at a level that you can handle so that you and your uh, compatriots don't have to play too many cards but you don't want to have it too low and just not be making any progress whatsoever so let's just say for now for the first mission uh, just to illustrate this each player is going to get their uh, three cards off the top of the deck which is the minimum you have to do at the beginning so, all right, everyone's got their three trial cards. Now you're going to move on to the next phase, which is the actual mission phase. And this is where starting with the first player and going around clockwise, each player plays cards from their hands. Uh, well, I, well, what I should say is you have an action you can take, which much of the time is going to be playing cards from your hand, but not necessarily. So the first type of action is playing those cards. And there's two different cards that you're going to play. One are threat cards, one are hard knocks cards. Threat cards are cards that only have artwork on them, various different symbols and terrain pictured on them. If you play a threat card, it's going to go into the no man's land. So it's just a threat that is out there in the area. The hard Nox cards are essentially like evil enchantments, if you want to think of them in that way. They are cards that you play and they immediately go in front of you. That counts as a wound, at least one wound, and it's going to give you usually a nasty ability that you are now afflicted with. Now let me show you the threat cards, and just to illustrate what they are, there's six different types of threats. There's three different symbol threats. You have a gas mask, you have a bullet, and you have a whistle. Uh, you also have three different types of terrain threats. You have snow, nighttime, and you have rain. What you want to not happen is have three identical threats out in the no man's land or in front of players, because as we'll illustrate in a moment, some of the hard knocks cards have threats on them and they count as threats. You do not want three identical threats. If that happens at any time, then the mission is a failure. If the mission is a failure, every single card that is in the no man's land gets shuffled back into the trial deck. So you've effectively made no progress whatsoever and actually things get worse, which I'll get to in good time. So you have those different types of threats. Um, you also have traps. If a card has a trap on it, when you put it out into no man's land, you have to immediately draw another card from the threat uh, from the trial deck if there is one to draw. And if it is uh, whatever it is, you have to take it. Either if it's a hard Nox card, it goes in front of you. Or if it's a threat card, it also goes into no man's land, although you ignore it if it's another trap. You also have cards that have more than one threat on them. So this counts as both nighttime and snow. And this is the granddaddy of them all. <laughs> this counts as three different, uh, all six symbols, essentially. And there's some that only have two symbols and so on and so forth. Now let me show you the hard knocks cards to let you know what I'm talking about there. Uh, you have phobias, which count as one of the uh, symbol threats. You have traumas, which count as one of the terrain threats. This one is rain. Then you have others that just have really nasty things they do to you. So mute actually says that you can no longer communicate with other players in any way and you may not use the speech tokens because you're completely mute. Prideful says you may withdraw only if your hand is empty or if you are the last one still in the mission. 
And wounded doesn't have any special ability, but it counts as two wounds. Remember, you can only take four before you lose the game altogether. So that's one type of action you can take. Another action you can take is to use your special ability, which lets you discard, as I described before, a threat matching your particular character symbol from the no man's land area. It doesn't count for traumas or phobias. The next type of action is the speech tokens. If you have a speech token, you can use it as your action and you can declare a type of threat, any of the six threats. Right then and there, you and all the other players can then discard one of those cards out of the game that has a type of threat on it. If no one has it or if certain people don't have it, they don't get to do anything. If you have more than one, you still only get to do one, but regardless, you get to discard one type of threat from everyone's hand. And the last type of action you get to take is withdrawing. Now, withdrawing takes you out of the mission. You no longer have to play any cards or anything of the sort. And if you have support tokens available, which might not always be the case, then you also lay down a support tile in secret. I'll get back to that in a minute and explain what it means. But you always do it in secret. You can't tell people what you're choosing to do. Uh, and then play is going to go to the next person. And other players are going to continue to take turns until um, everyone potentially withdraws. Now let's talk about the end of the mission. And by the way, things won't look quite like this. You'll have uh, more cards out in the no man's land, uh, without a doubt. Uh, so it'll, it'll be quite a few cards out there, but hopefully and definitely not three symbols. Well, now, if there ever is three symbols, as I mentioned before, the mission is an immediate failure. And then everything that's out in the no man's land gets shuffled back into the main deck. And then you go to the rest of the uh, end of mission cleanup. But if everyone withdrew, whether or not they used support tiles or not, if they couldn't possibly do it, and uh, that happens before three symbols were out there, then the mission is successful, in which case all the cards that are in the no man's land are actually going to get discarded out of the game. Any hard knocks cards, however, stay in front of you, and any cards that you still uh, maintained in your hand will stay in front of you as well. So the next thing you do is support. Everyone flips over the tokens. Any of the withdrawn players who played on the support tokens will flip over the token that they secretly selected, and then you determine who gets them. So this one says that it goes over to the left. This one goes to the right. This one also goes to the right. This one goes two to the left, and this one goes to the right. So that's actually a bad thing because we had a tie. If there's a tie for people who have the most gained support tokens during this phase, nobody gets anything. But if one person gains the majority of support tokens, something good happens to them. They can either get rid of two uh, wounds worth of hard Nox cards. Oh, I'm sorry, let me rephrase that. You can get rid of just two hard Nox cards, regardless of the number of wounds that are on them. Or you can recover your good luck charm ability. And that is the only way to recover your super special ability. Now, this may still happen if you failed the mission. But if you failed the mission, then you only uh, get to... And whoever gets the most support of the players that were able to withdraw before you failed the mission... Um, then whoever got the most support is only able to get rid of a single hard knocks card, and that's it. That's the only option they have. And then after this, you check to see if you've lost the game or won the game entirely. You've lost the game entirely if either the monument is showing or... Um, well, actually, no, that'll come in a second. But if one player has more than four wound cards, uh, wounds in front of them from the hard knocks cards, then the game will end immediately. And if every player was able to get rid of every card in hand and the peace card is showing, then you've won immediately. But if that, none of those things have happened, then it goes to the morale drop. And here's where you might potentially lose or things are just going to get worse for you. The morale drop is the game working against you. And you're going to count up all the cards that you have left in players' hands and take that number of cards and add them back into the trial deck. But assuming the game doesn't end, the first player marker is going to pass to the next player clockwise. And if the mission was successful, only if the mission was successful and not a failure, then whoever the previous first player was gets one of those speech tokens. That's how you get the speech tokens. And then you're going to do it all over again. You're trying to play as many cards as you possibly can and trying not to get a set of three threats. And then if you can do that, you can get rid of all of them, get rid of as many cards as you can in your hand so that less cards from the morale deck, which by the way, always has to be a minimum of three cards, even if you did very well, have to go into the uh, trial deck. But try to get through that trial deck as fast as you possibly can without meeting any of the end game conditions. If you can uncover the peace card and have no cards left in hand, you will win the game. That is The Grizzled. Let's get to my final thoughts. The Grizzled is very interesting in a number of ways. It's very unique in a number of ways. And those are the primary reasons why I like this game. I don't love it. I do have some caveats with it. It's not the greatest thing in the world. And I do have some issues with it. But overall, I like it because of... It just feels like nothing else quite that I have played. 
Um, if I can start off with the obvious, let's talk about the artwork, which I already mentioned in my intro as being great, and I'll stand by that here as well. It's, it's very tough to explain. When you look at the character portraits on the, the grizzled cards themselves that you have in front of each of you, it's almost whimsical in a sense. I've seen this kind of uh, old-timey style artwork before, and it's almost lighthearted. But then when you look at the, the threat cards out there on the table that have this very... Uh, there's no text on them. It's just this very stark, contrasting artwork of the different types of climate and the different objects, the gas mass, which just is a gas mass. That's all that it is. But within the context of the storyline of the game, it kind of takes on a, a, a bigger meaning that I wasn't quite prepared for. I, I really um, found myself appreciating that they that these things, that the storyline behind the game and the what you're supposed to represent, what your characters are supposed to represent, and what you're trying to do, which is just survive. These things together with that very stark um, artwork really spoke to me. It really did. I mean, there's no gore in this game. You would never know that this is a game that is based in war from squinting at it, but that's very much what it is. And that backstory of what this was based on, the fact that in real life during World War I, this was happening all over France, where there were people being conscripted into war who were just these young men, and boys really, who were probably going to die. They were just probably going to die. They were probably going to die either with their friends or being separated from their friends and their loved ones, and that was that. And so it's a very somber thing. And I could just appreciate that. So I, that's probably my favorite thing about this game is the theme and what you're supposed to be doing, going off and working together. And I think that, uh, mechanically speaking, tying the theme together with the, the mechanisms of the game, this is a fully cooperative game. And it really feels like that. And I say that because I play a lot of cooperative games where, you know, someone can be the alpha game or that old trope. Or someone can just hot dog it and go and do their own thing. But in this game... With, and it is tough because of the limited communication you're allowed to have with each other. You do have to work together. You have to read what your uh, your teammates are going to be trying to play. Uh, play your cards and your speech tokens at the right time. Um, and then when you're the, uh, the starting player, when you have the opportunity to deal out the cards to people, be able to know how much your teammates can handle. Again, with the limited amount of communication that you can have with each other, it really makes it feel like a game where it, that is purely cooperative, that you are definitely trying to help each other out at every step. And again, that ties back into the theme. If I can also just make another side note to the theme um, the, and the art as well, it is yet another sort of somber note to it that um, the artist was killed in the uh, the Charlie Hebdo attacks, this artist Tignus, which again, this has nothing to do with the, the theme of this particular game or the uh, the game mechanisms as well. But I guess it's interesting to me that his one of his last published works was this game which was all about this sort of unspeakable violence that uh, is not an accident. This was something that a very dark time is, of many, many dark times we've had in our history. Something that could have been avoided, but... It's people being thrown in the circumstances that they couldn't possibly have asked for or known to avoid, much like the artist himself was. I don't know. It's completely separate from anything else. I just thought that was both interesting and tragic and something to definitely be noted and not forgotten. Uh, but going back into the gameplay, if I wanted to be negative about it, and I do think that the main issue with the game is... <sighs> kind of tied to one of its strengths. This is a very simple game. It's very easy to learn. I would actually say that the rule book is not great. And the first time that you go through it, it's kind of confusing. Like, what exactly are we supposed to be doing? And what do the support tokens mean? It's not laid out in the best, most efficient way. But once you play it the first time, you're like, okay, very, very simple. It's just play cards, try to help each other out, uh, use your special abilities very judiciously, and uh, just try to get down through that deck as quickly as possible before your morale runs out and keeps getting flooded with more and more and more cards. It's a very simple concept. And ultimately what I think hurts the game is that you really are just like play this card here and you know put this card in front of me and so on. It's so simple almost to a fault. And at times when you play it enough, the theme, which is great, starts to drift away and it feels more just like a, a puzzle game, which to be fair a lot of cooperative games fall into. I would put this in the same bucket and also the same weight as games like Hanabi and like The Game from earlier this year, the Spiel des Jahres nominee, because they're abstract to a certain degree. 
uh, those two games are way more abstract than this, but also just feel like a puzzle sort of numbers game in a sense. It's not like a lot of number crunching in the Grizzled, but it is, okay, how many cards does each of us have in our hand? How many can we feasibly take from the deck in order to keep... Um, to keep in front of the morale deck and to keep from being overloaded with cards and so on and so forth. Um, it is very tense at times because it's like, okay, I can't take any more hard knocks cards. We, you know, we can stop right now and jump out because we can't, no one can play another card or I don't think the rest of my teammates can play another card without having to put, uh, have three identical scenarios out in the row. But, uh, what do we do if we if we drop out now? We're still loaded with cards. We're t- that means we have to put a ton more morale cards into the deck. That is a very tense situation and something to try to um, to work around. But again, at the same time, it feels like you're just playing a numbers game. Like oh, there's that many out there, uh, and then the whole thing with the support tokens can be a little bit confusing. It's very difficult to have the tokens go in the place that you want them to go, especially since your communication as to what token you're putting down has to be so limited. So it's very hard to plan with that. And I felt that that was a little bit too clunky, even at the same time acknowledging that it was a unique system and a good try. I just felt like it didn't work as well as I wanted it to. And also the speech tokens as well and how those are distributed. These just feel like interesting mechanisms just kind of thrown together and they don't really flow well into one another that much. I would say that probably the biggest issue I have is with the difficulty, which is wildly different from game to game. Depending on which cards you get and which hard knocks players have to be afflicted with and how soon they have to receive them, the game can be very, very simple or just uh, really, really cripplingly difficult. And sometimes that changes on a the fly when you get down through the deck. You can be having a tremendously easy time for most of the game, get down to the bottom of the deck and realize, oh, we're totally screwed. Like nothing we did before matters because we can't possibly get around the arrangement of cards that we have out here now. And there's just too few decks left in the morale deck. We are going to lose. That monument is going to be uncovered. So I didn't quite like the fact that it just was so swingy in one direction or the other. If it was just consistently brutally difficult, I, I felt like we could just get better at the game over time. I'd probably appreciate it uh, quite a bit more. Um, and then sometimes it's just way, way easy. Now, I have played this game with two players as well. This is not a two-player game. This is a three- to five-player game for sure. The more, the merrier. With two players, you have a dummy player, and it just feels weird. Um, this is one of those cooperative games that is meant to be played with more people. Uh, again, making it similar to Hanabi. And, well, Hanabi works better with two, so eh, forget that. Um, Overall, though, again, I do like the game. It's certainly not a terrible game. I love what they're going for. When the theme is present, when you can really engross yourself in it, it, it's really good. And I love that the cooperative aspect is purely cooperative. You really do have to work with each other as best you can and learn the subtle communication within the confines of the rules of the game. I just wish it wasn't as swingy. I wish that at times it felt more thematic, like you weren't just you know, number crunching and trying to figure out the best, like, okay, hold on to this card now because we're going to take this many cards, but that just felt a little bit too dry to me, but I love the artwork and presentation, and there is something here, and there is definitely something to be be said for such a unique and thought-provoking game that is the grizzled from Coleman or not. Thanks for watching. Follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Patreon. And make sure to check out our sponsor, Board Game Bliss, where you can find an amazing selection of games from around the world. BoardGameBliss.com. Thanks for your support.